Well, good morning, everyone. Hey, I hope that you guys are having as good a time as I am today. I love gathering with you guys, so this is a really special day for me. And I, I learned something last service that I wasn't really aware of until today, and uh, that's that I am the oldest staff member here at Riverlong. <laughs> Can you guys read that from back there? <laughs> yeah, I realized for the first time that I read a giant, <laughs> I read a giant print Bible. One of these days, I'm guaranteeing you, one of these days you will too. And there's a reason I love, I love God's word and I don't want to strain over it. And so having it here in these large letters makes it so much easier to read. And I can, I can concentrate on the word instead of on my bad eyesight. Today... I want you to think of God's word the way that you might think of an anti-anxiety anti -anxiety pill. Christmas time. We're going to talk about two things. Christmas anxiety and then peace on earth. Is it possible for there to be such a thing as peaceful anxiety? or to be peacefully anxious. I know, they sound like oxymorons, and for a lot of people, this is a real issue at Christmas time. They are seeking peace, and all they find is anxiety. Whatever that anxiety might be, whatever might cause that anxiety, as they seek peace, they find anxiety, and this is a time, it's supposed to be peace on earth. I don't know about you guys, but I love, I absolutely love Christmas music. I love the, the, the bells. I love the orchestra. I, I just love it. We had Christmas music all the time in my house. I also love crowds. And right now we have a crowd. I love to hang out in crowds at Christmas time. One of my favorite things to do. And I, now... Men out there, don't get the wrong idea here. I, I love shopping at Christmas. Okay. I'm not a shopper. I love shopping at Christmas. And I don't know about you, but I love to go into stores that I know I cannot afford to buy anything. <laughs> we got Van Muir and we got uh, Dillard's. Back in my day as a kid, it, it was the Broadway at the Buena Ventura Fashion Mall. And at the Broadway, you walk in, and there's not a single thing in there. $100, back then, a $100 bottle of perfume. And you're going, whoa, that's a Christmas gift? No wonder people are anxiety, have anxiety. So I would go there for this reason, the same reason I do today. You walk in, and, and it, it seems like it's always a perfume aisle out front. <sighs> smells wonderful. Smells like Christmas. They always have great sound systems. It sounds like Christmas. And it looks like Christmas. They have enough money to really pile on the decorations. So I love shopping at stores I can't afford. I never buy anything, but they don't know that. And I love gatherings, whether they are church gatherings, family gatherings, work gatherings, whatever they are. I love when we get together and so on. But do you realize... That those same things that I love so much can cause great anxiety for so many others. They have this, this problem of, of thinking about the difficulties in life and it overshadows everything about Christmas. It brings this dark shadow of anxiety. And we want to talk about that today. And so... I want you guys to learn one thing. We need to cast our anxieties on Jesus. We need to cast our anxieties, our worries on Jesus. Heavenly Father, I come to you and I ask, Lord God, that you would help us so much to get through Christmas, Lord, with joy and with peace 
And Lord, with an understanding of it's all about you. Lord, let us put the anxieties aside and think about you. Father, we just want to give you glory and praise today and always. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, when I talk about anxiety, I want to make sure you guys understand. I'm not necessarily talking about things like clinical depression. I'm not necessarily talking about uh, diseases that require medical attention. Although I do know for a fact that Jesus can heal all those too. That any problem that you guys have, whether it is medical or it's psychological, whatever it might be, Jesus can handle it. Jesus wants to handle it. And he wants you to cast all of your worries on him. He can take these worries away. What I really want to focus on today, though, instead of those, I want to focus on the anxiety that so many of us have that take us away from Jesus at this time of year. And you know that it happens. Many of you right now are all are at this point thinking about, how am I going to get the right gift? How am I going to get the right decoration? Who's coming over for dinner? What party am I going to go to? I got five of them on the same day. And you start to get anxious. What am I going to do? Cast your anxiety on Jesus. Listen to this. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Most of you know I come from California, so a lot of people in California have no idea what a yoke is. But here we do. A yoke is something that goes around the ox's neck here and the ox's neck there. And if it is made correctly, it fits the ox, and the ox pleasantly moves his stock if it fits correctly. And if you've got two, and they both fit, and you've got this perfect fit between the two ox. They work together well. And Jesus is telling us that we will work together well with him. His burden is like his yoke is easy. Can you imagine you got a yoke on and you're light, and a burden in the back is light and those ox are just cruising happy as can be. That's what Jesus is telling us here. Cast your burdens on me. Christmas anxiety is so much about us striving for the things that aren't the most important. Go ahead, be like me, and love the music, love the shopping, love the gatherings, love the crowds. But remember this, that is not the reason for the season. I don't really like that that, that slogan, the reason for the season, because Christmas isn't a season. Christmas should be all the time. It should be something that we do all the time. But I'll tell you what, when you make the reason for the season, all of the things that the world says you have to do, all of the shopping, all the gathering, all the parties, all the decorations, all the baking, when the world tells you you have to do that, anxiety starts to hit you like a ton of bricks. And you forget everything that Jesus really wants I asked this question of the day, what is anxiety? What is Christmas anxiety? And my good friend, Caleb Isaac, said, Christmas anxiety is forgetting who Jesus is. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not talking about the clinical issues, although those can be helped by this. I'm talking about your Christmas anxiety today. It's forgetting who Jesus is. We end up caught up in the three biggest worries of Christmas, and that is time, money, and emotions. And it all starts with the fact that we never have enough time. There is never enough time for what we need to get done. I just heard somebody today, after I after I'd given this teaching earlier, and they tell me, but I'm so busy. I'm so busy, I got so many things to do. What demands your time? What is it that demands your time? Is it shopping? Is it family? Is it gatherings? Is it parties? Is it baking? 
decorations? Is it friends? The list can go on and on and on. And we spend so much time trying to create the perfect Christmas. The one that you see on the Hallmark Channel. The one that you see on the beautiful Christmas cards. We spend so much time trying to do that that we forget who Jesus is. We start to follow a path that leads us away from Jesus. So maybe we need to rethink our Christmas decision-making paradigm. Now, a paradigm in the simplest definition is a system to interpret your path. What system are you using to interpret your path this Christmas? I want you to listen to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Listen to what he has to say here. I think that this will work a lot when it comes to time. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. That's the first Christmas or first biblical verse that I ever learned in my life. I'd become a Christian. I'd only been it for a little while. My wife bought me a Bible and inside the Bible is written Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And I learned that and I've lived by it. I love that verse so much. And when it comes to time, it really will benefit you. Who are you trusting? Are you trusting the Lord? Or are you leaning on your own understanding? Because think about it honestly. Christmas, this time of year, the world wants you to understand all about parties, gifts, decorations, everything that just, that just takes all the time in the world to get done. It doesn't ask you to follow the path that God actually desires for you. What path are you taking? And here's the problem, is that we are so overworked. Here's what Martin Luther had to say. This verse should ring an incredible bell to each and every one of you. Martin Luther says, work, work from morning until late at night. In fact, I have so much work to do that I shall have to spend the first three hours in prayer. Have you ever thought about that? You have a 12-hour day in front of you. Have you ever thought that I'm going to spend the first three hours in prayer? Think about it. You got a 12-hour day of busyness in front of you? Spend the first three hours in prayer and you'll find that you don't need 12 hours of busyness. God will give you that path. One of the things that Martin Luther is saying here is that we are all too busy not to pray. So often we hear, I am too busy to, I'm too busy to read my Bible, I'm too busy to pray, I'm too busy to go to church, I'm too busy to this, too busy for that. When it comes to Jesus, we seem to be too busy. When it comes to everything else, we got plenty of time, but we're too busy I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. Time is such an important part of the path that we are on. And when we trust our own understanding, so many times we find that we are navigating our time poorly. We are navigating our time poorly. Listen to Ephesians. This is Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. And I want you to listen to this maybe as you've never listened to it before. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best time of your day because the days are evil. Do you realize that everyone and everything this time of year is trying to take you away from Jesus? It's trying to take Christmas away from Jesus. In fact, I am blessed when I go into a store and I hear people say, Merry Christmas. Because what do you normally hear when you go into stores anymore? Happy holidays. Whose holiday? What holiday? What holiday are you talking about when you say happy holidays? Anything that takes you away from Jesus. And so, One of the best ways that the world 
can take you away from Jesus is to keep you so busy with everything but the birth of that baby. Everything but. This verse just emphasizes how important it is to have a wise use of your time and making the most of your opportunities. Anybody in here know what Jeff calls those opportunities? Who said that? Raise your hand. Yeah, be proud. Let's go. <laughs> Give me a second here. God opportunities. God, you've got to love that we have so many God opportunities this time of year. The problem is, is that we're finding that the world is trying to fill us with distractions and challenges. So ask yourself this. What is it that is distracting you from your biblical beliefs of Christmas? And then what out there is challenging those beliefs? Are you so caught up in the trappings of the hallmark Christmas that you are forgetting your beliefs? Have you been distracted away from that? What is more important? Jesus or the perfect present to give to somebody. And, and don't, don't get me wrong. I love giving the perfect gift. It's, to me, it's fun. For some people, giving the perfect gift is anxiety-driven. Guys, don't be anxious. The Bible says don't be anxious for anything, but all things in prayer and perdition. Thank God. You don't need to be worried about all this stuff. So here's what I want to ask you. What is taking up your time during Christmas? Is it prayer? Is it recognizing the unique and powerful gift that Jesus was? Are you taking time to encourage people who are struggling with anxiety? Are you working to help people overcome the issues that are bothering this Christmas? Or, or are you filled with anxiety over shopping? Are you cursing the person who took your parking space? Christians even, listen to this. It's a great time for you to practice this part. We have four services on Christmas Eve. Guaranteed, this, well, you, it may be the second or third. One of those two are going to be the most busy. So you come to one of those And you may find that your coveted parking space is not there. You may find that the chair that you've sat in every week for the last 50 weeks is taken. So are you going to go, oh, praise God, my seat's taken because so many people are here that don't know the Lord. Or are you going to go, that's my chair. (laughs) Do you realize I had to walk 25 extra feet? Are you cursing the person taking your parking spot? Are you trying so hard to keep up with the demands of the Hallmark Christmas? (laughs) Are you so concerned with getting the right decoration on that tree? You know, the one that has the baby's birth date on the bottom of it. What do you do if your oldest child accidentally breaks the youngest child's ball? What's more important, the baby Jesus or that ornament? Because I see people lose it over something as small as as an ornament. The advertisers out there are doing everything to steal the joy of Christ and put in the joy of Madison Avenue or wherever it might be. There is nothing wrong with giving the perfect gift, but please don't let this Christmas be filled with cursing, anxiety, and panic. And you know, if time isn't enough to drive you crazy... It also seems that there is never enough money. Never enough money. Money should never be an issue at Christmas time. Do you guys know the movie Christmas with the Cranks? You guys seen it? 
do you know that he's sitting there, they, they decide that daughter goes off to the Peace Corps, so they're not going to do Christmas. They're going to skip Christmas this year. It's a John Grisham book that was actually called Skipping Christmas. And so there is Mr. Crank, and this is, this is what is this? What am I doing? What? Thank you. You knew it. So anyway, he's working the calculator, and when he finishes up, he finds out that he has spent $6,000 on Christmas every single year for however long. Five years, that's $30,000. Why? Why was he spending that much money? $6,000 a year to impress who? Who? Why was he doing it? What was the purpose of him doing all of this money? Was it to buy gifts? He was actually buying gifts, buying trimmings for the tree, buying lights, buying food for people he didn't even like. Because if you know the movie, the Frohmeyers were his neighbors and he did not like the Frohmeyers. But but they threw this big giant party every year and all these big invitations. And they didn't spend like $15 for a pack of invitations. They spent hundreds of dollars for a pack of invitations. Why? To impress people they didn't even like. I don't know. I I really need to to see a, a, a raising of hands. How many of you people know who Will Rogers is? Well... Not very many. Will Rogers was, a, was like a cowboy philosopher. He used, to, he used to do this lasso thing, and he would philosophize. And one of his great philosophies was, we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. Now, I'm not saying that you guys buy stuff because you don't like people, but... Clark Griswold did. (laughs) See, you guys know Clark Griswold, right? From A Christmas Vacation. He put up tons of lights. He put up all the stuff because he was going to have his in-laws over for Christmas, a big Christmas. He didn't even like his in-laws and they didn't like him. So why did he do it? Jesus was nowhere near Clark Griswold. Nowhere at all. What is the perfect gift? What is the perfect gift to give? Listen to this. This is from Luke chapter 2, 17 8. I know you've heard a million times, but listen to it a little differently this time. When they had seen him, the shepherds, when the shepherds had seen him, they spread word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Amazed. When was the last time that you guys were truly amazed, truly amazed by Jesus Christ at Christmas time? John chapter 1 should just give you everything you need to know about why you should be amazed. John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. He was there with God in the beginning. And he made all things. And everything was made through him. And nothing that was made was made without him. So Jesus is the creator of everything. And the creator, in verse 14 of that same chapter, says that the word became flesh and lived with us. The creator came here. I don't know how many of you guys are art fans, but I would love to sit down with Leonardo da Vinci or Picasso. Really like to sit down with Jackson Pollock. Do you know who he was? Jackson Pollock threw a bunch of paint on a canvas and sold it for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I'd like to sit down with him and say, Jackson, what were you thinking? What was it that made you say, if I splash this paint on here, people are going to love it? I would love to ask the creator of the world, the greatest artist of all time, why? What were you thinking? Guess what? We can. We have got 
the artist of this entire universe, right here, telling us why he did it and what he was thinking. And he calls us his masterpiece. Not the Grand Canyon, not the solar system, not the Milky Way. You, we are, we are his masterpiece. So, do you bask in the glory of his masterpiece? Or do you find yourself stuck in a place where there is more than enough emotion? A more than enough emotion to drive you crazy. You know, for many people, Christmas is a great happy time. I mean, there's feelings of joy, excitement, anticipation. We've got contentment. We've got fond memories. But for just as many people, just as many people, there are feelings of negative nostalgia, sadness, frustration, exhaustion, stress, panic, and even pain. Think about it. And I've talked to a lot of people today already who are missing somebody this Christmas. Either through passing away, through separation, uh, marriage happened with children, and they go, and so we're missing people. And that's a really tough thing for a lot of people to, to go through. Now, I don't want to spend this time talking about psychology. You know, if you guys have some clinical issues or you have, uh, you have a Christmas time anxiety, depression that you want to talk about, my office is open, make an appointment, we'll sit down and we'll have a long talk about how Jesus can overcome so much of this if we put him first instead of making him like the last thing on our mind. I think though, when it comes to all these anxieties, even when it comes to missing somebody, even when it comes to running out of money, even when it comes to running out of time, Charles Dickens said it best. He said, for it is good to be children sometimes and never better than at Christmas when its mighty founder was a child himself. And Charles capitalized founder. It's mighty founder was a child himself. You know, some of my best memories of Christmas are as a child. I didn't have anxiety, but I was anxious for it. I didn't have worry. I was excited for it. I never had any panic. I was never filled with pain or sorrow. Christmas was a time of excitement. One of my favorite emotions of all time is excitement. And Christmas was a time of excitement for me. I still, as an adult, I try sometimes to get myself back to that time when Christmas was all about the joy of being a child. It'll never happen. I will never be a child again. As you see, children don't need this. But I always think about what Charles Dickens said, is that the mighty founder was a child himself. And when I think about, about Jesus, the mighty founder, coming from heaven as a child down to here, what an awesome, awesome, powerful thought that is. And all of a sudden, the child in me, the childlike faith in me just comes pouring out. And Christmas is a whole different thing for me now. It really isn't about presents or decorations. Don't get me wrong. I love it. I love going home and seeing lights and stuff. They're great. But it's not the focal point. It's not the path that God most desires for me at this time. So just, just to help you remember, these emotions that we feel... They kind of stifle us this time of year and try to take us away from Jesus. But those emotions, there's nothing new about them. Think about this. That very first Christmas, before Jesus was born, as they were moving, Mary and Joseph, let's see what they were feeling. So Mary and Joseph probably had some enjoyment. Why? Because they heard that they were going to be the parents of who? God. God. And you go, wait, God doesn't have any parents. Yeah, but if Jesus is God, they were the parents of God. And so there's complete enjoyment when Joseph finally heard that. He's like, oh, good, I can marry her. Everything's good. But with that same enjoyment comes emotional stress. Huh. Were the parents of God? There's some emotional stress involved. The travel itself, 
extreme exhaustion going on that road trip. The expectations, what is it going to be like when we get to Bethlehem? We actually have this baby. Yes, and then the disappointment of finding out that there's absolutely no room in Bethlehem. There's no family to take you in. And so all of a sudden, you, now you go back to these fond, nostalgic memories of what it's like to spend this time, not Christmas, but to spend this time with my family wherever they were. And then you have this joy in recognizing that, yes, we're going to be the parents of God. And then there's the financial stress and the mental stress. And then there's pleasure. And then there's pressure. Then there's contentment. And then there's sorrow because there's nobody there to be with them. And then there's guilt because, oh, poor Joseph couldn't provide a better way to get there. So yes, from the very beginning, there was all of this incredible difficulty But God took them through it all. Listen to what Matthew says. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. What is the number one thing that needs to be given to you? It's that peace. It's that understanding. And he says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. What do people seek most at Christmas? Do they seek the kingdom? Or do they seek what they see on the Hallmark Channel? I don't know why, but I I love my family. But when I go over there for Christmas, my sister has the Hallmark Channel on 24-7. It's like a Christmas soap opera that runs all day long. And I, and I love my sister, but I think sometimes she wants to have a Hallmark Christmas. And my sister loves the Lord, but still there's that Hallmark Christmas thing. Do we seek Madison Avenue? Do we seek Hallmark? Or do we seek the kingdom during Christmas? This year, I just challenge you to take a Christmas light tour. And take a look at how many houses out there have manger scenes. It'll be more than you think. Also, how many of those mangers have no babies? No baby Jesus. Have you seen mangers with no baby Jesus? I see people going, oh, that's horrible. That's horrible. No baby Jesus in the manger. No, it's perfectly natural. Jesus wasn't born yet. Until Christmas morning, the, ba- the manger should be empty. <laughs> then on Christmas morning, you take the baby and you put the baby in the manger, and it's all legit, right? It's all historical. <laughs> That's the explanation anyway. But as you look, take family, take friends. We used to do a light tour. There's some kids here that will remember light tours that we took. But we go on light tours, and we look at the lights, and you remember The light of the world was Jesus. You see the manger. Remember the baby in the manger was the the flesh and blood of God. And then you see the star and you say, that star guides us right to the Lord Jesus. And so as you're driving around looking at Christmas lights on Candy Cane Lane and stuff, point out, point out the Jesus moments that are in those lights. It's amazing what it will do. And how it will help the people in your vehicle remember what Jesus and Christmas is all about. What we need to do is we need to understand that we need to have peace of mind and heart. Listen to this. I am leaving you with a gift. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. The peace that Jesus is talking about here is not the peace of no war, no conflict, no bickering, no backbiting, no gossiping, no confrontation. That's not the peace he's talking about. The peace he's talking about is no fear. We do not fear what everybody fears is death. We don't fear it. 
We don't need to be like everything else because we have no fear. God did not give us a spirit of fear and timidity, but one of power, love, and self-discipline. Matthew 1.22 says this. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Ralph Washington Sockman said it this way, the hinge of history is on the door of a Bethlehem stable. The hinge of history is on the door of a Bethlehem stable. Everything, that first Christmas day, everything changed. Everything. You are no longer alone in this world. No matter who you've lost, no matter where you are, No matter how much anxiety there is, you are not alone. History changed. It was hinged on that door in Bethlehem where no longer are you alone. It says Emmanuel, which means God with us. Christmas, according to Robert Hughes, Christmas began in the heart of God It is complete when it reaches the heart of man. Why wait for a call when you have a command? Why wait for a call when you have a command? And that command is very simple. Go, make disciples of the nations. What better time to do that than Christmas time? Hearts are ready to hear something about Jesus, even if they don't know it. Don't worry about all the trappings of Christmas. Don't get caught up in having to get your kids the perfect gift. Don't get caught up in having to have your house decorated so that the world can see it. Don't get caught up in all the parties and the time that you can't get it all done. Don't be worried about the money because you're not going to spend it all. You are going to take the time for the most perfect gift of all, and that is to encourage others who are struggling through the anxiety of Christmas. Think about that. Are you worried or are you encouraging? Just remember, the perfect gift was Jesus. And it was given to each and every one of us. And this Christmas, remember the peace and then share that. Share that with everyone. Heavenly Father, we come and we ask, please take away the worry, the anxiety, Lord, take away the concerns of time, money, and emotions. Instead, Lord, give us a peace, a peace that only you can provide, a peace that means no fear, no fear of what the world can throw at us because, Lord, we have you. Remind us of Emmanuel, God with us. Lord, so badly, that is what we desire. And, Father, we just give you praise and glory for what you're going to do this Christmas to give us one a true Christmas. Peace on earth. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.